Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here and welcome back to Board Game Blender. Today we are talking about getting from point A to point B. So these are games in which you are going to be traveling, you're going to be picking something up and delivering, you are going to be connecting to different spots, things of that nature. And I, I find these games very appealing because usually for one thing they have a map, and I like maps, I like having a nice board with some uh, lovely topography on it, but also I think just this feeling of of getting a, a small task done, delivering something, putting something where it goes, just has a very uh, uh, pleasing nature to it. It's a very relaxing thing to to finalize, you know. It feels like um, it gives me the same feeling as when I organize something. And then once it's done, I feel much better about it being done. So, without any further ado, let's kick it off and check out some fun games. Here we go. Wow, a lot of great comments last episode. Wait a minute, somebody wants me to mail my parents to them? I gotta call my mother for this one. Yeah, mom, did you know that somebody wants me to mail you to them? I know, I'm ready to go. Well, you're not going. Hello? Hello? How rude. I hope it's somewhere warm. Hello friends of the blend and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. The title of today's show, Point A to Point B. I have one here for you. But the box has seen better days. Through the miracle of CGI, there we go. Codename Sector, published in 1977 by Parker Brothers. This is a two to four player game in which you're all trying to locate and destroy a hidden submarine. Let me set this up and show you how it works. So this is what the game board will look like set up. First, every player is going to get a different color marker to mark where his ship is at on the map. The submarine is actually going to go with hidden movements and it's going to be stored in this computer right here along with all the ship's movements. So I'm going to turn on the navigation system on here and then in the display you'll see that uh, player number one, ship one, his speed which is at zero and the location on the map which is 35 north, 25 east. So ship number one is located at 35 north, 25 east. So you take your color marker and just mark an X where your ship starts. After you know the location of your ship, you're going to hit range here on the sonar control and that'll tell you how many squares the sub is away from you, uh, north, south, east, or west. To move your ship, you'll hit the move ship button and then you'll use the steering control, uh, whether you want to go left or right. So if it was pointing north and you hit the button right, you'll be heading east. Now when the ship moves, he's going to move five squares in whatever direction that you're pointing at. And you also can control your speed, uh, going either faster or slower. After the first player has moved the ship and potentially fired a torpedo where he thinks the submarine is at, it's the next ship's turn. You just hit this button here that says next ship and it'll say ship number two. He'll, the ship number two will grab another color and he'll have his starting position. And he does the exact same thing that player one has done. Hitting the range to see how many spaces he is away from his ship and potentially moving a ship and potentially firing a torpedo. You successfully win the game if you can destroy the sub. For a longer game, you go to a predetermined amount and every time you destroy the sub, you will get the scoring marker. Once you hit that predetermined amount, you're the winner of the game. For being 1977, this is a very difficult game to learn how to play. It comes with a 30 page rulebook for crying out loud. As the game progresses, there's gonna be a lot of different color lines on the board using this navigation tool. I've only scratched the surface on how to use this combat information center and there's a lot more to it. Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. Hey guys, I'm Ben. And I'm Tommy. 
And we're talking board games. And this week on Blender, we are doing A to B, which is basically getting from the point to that point. Uh, specifically, point A to point B, point B, connecting cities. In that order, don't confuse it with never. A, B to A. Oh, no, never going no, B to no, A. That's totally that would be. Oh, are you kidding me? I can't I'm believe sorry, you brought I, it up. I'm sorry, I said it. I shouldn't. No, have you know what? Up. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, let's just go ahead and consider, consider the comments. comments. Okay. Um, do you want to go Made first, or? Um, <laughs> well, yes. Why don't we? Why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Uh, Tell what game we're doing, actually. That's that's a good idea. Oh, well, I mean, you probably guessed. It's Great Western Trail. Um, <laughs> I did say this week on, and then we didn't even no, say. No, we didn't, no. So it's Great this Western week, Trail. This uh, A to B, we're doing Great Western Trail. Um, why, don't we, why don't we popcorn here? So you do one, I'll do one, you do one, I'll do one. I thought we were doing one each. Oh, I, I have so many one. good ones. I Fine. know. I... You do one, I'll do three. How about you? Okay, you go one, bad one. Good one, bad one. Okay. Okay, we'll do three. Go. Much. So much. Too much. Way too much stuff. Feels like a game with 12 expansions included. My reference of game clunkiness. That's by Barry 2 from France. Oh. Mm. Wow, that was offensive. Sorry, French. And they rated it what? Oh, that was a one. I asked that because I'm already going to edit this and put the thing across the bottom, but I wanted to make sure that he knew that... Yes, it's You're it's, supposed to say. Yeah, I am supposed to. My mistake, guys. You're forgiven. Thank you. All right, we have rating this a ten. Wang Yanbo, 1994. I'm assuming that's the year he was born. Is it Chinese. Wang Yanbo, 1994. Yeah. yeah. Wang Yanbo. That's right. Just Wang like Yanbo. he said it. Yeah. Uh, he says. This is a very, very good game. <laughs> you said it's Chinese, I'm saying it in an accent. <laughs> I would have said otherwise. You're just offend offending all <laughs> cultures today. This is a very, very good game. You just trust me. <laughs> you play with me, you play with the best, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> Wang Yimbo, I want to play, uh, play this with you. You play with the best. I, I want to play with the best. Sucker. <laughs> that was funny. Um... I got a few more ones here. We no one more. We're okay, more. well these are both the same basically. So I got. Mm. He doesn't listen to me. Hanoth, <laughs> K, <clears throat> K Hanoth. We're gonna okay. go K Hanoth. Okay. He rates it a one and says unbelievably boring game of animal exploitation. <laughs> Kid Gusto, however, he goes on even more. Another shameful game by Fister, following up Mombasa with another poorly conceived theme reshaping genocide as a fun trading game with no native agency. No excuse for this, 20, for this in 2016. Ignorant at best, possibly intentionally racist. <laughs> I, I don't even want to comment on that. But he makes a fine argument. Suppose if you live that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, they all rated it a one. With good reason. Yeah, no, absolute... Good reason. I personally love this game. Great Western Trail. Great game. Great I do game. Uh, go check out our full review on it. Uh, basically, we say how great it is and how linear it is and how A to B <laughs> it is. Uh, but that's pretty much what it is. I mean, this is A to B at its getting cattle core. from A to B. Yep. You're you're moving from here to there to here to there to here to there. Probably about twenty plus times over the course of the game. Over the course of one turn. Uh, no. Yeah, well, it's a lot. You move. You're, you're moving a lot. You're doing the very same thing over and over again, and it can seem very repetitive. Um, like I said, go check out our full review on it. Uh, we'll, we kind of go into depth about it and, and talk about our full feelings, but, but absolutely great game. Yep. If you love genocide. Um, <laughs> animal exploitation. And animal exploitation and right clunky design. This is the game for you. Or but if you like being a sucker. Sucker. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of Blender. As Tommy always says, like, share, subscribe to Dice Towers. Comment. Don't forget about comment. See, that's why man. you do this. Comment. <laughs> you know the drill. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Clueless board 
Gamers, where I am trying to introduce my little sister Nora to new board games. Because she doesn't play that many games, so I thought it would be interesting to hear what she thinks about those games that I normally and you normally play. Today the theme is games in which we are trying to get as fast to a point as possible, so we are going to play... Nora. Nana really cannot play with us. It is okay if she sits here for a moment, but she cannot play with us. Why not? She, she's a cat. She doesn't have opposable thumbs. <gasps> Nana! Don't listen to that. Oh, poor Nana. You can become anything you want, Nana. Just dream. Why, you am, I, why am I even trying to do this with you? You are, uh, you are incredible. So today we are going to take a look at the game Clank. In this game, you are going to be a hero. And of course, because you're a hero, you have to do hero-y things. So you're going to go into the dungeon and slay the dragon. But most importantly, you are going to get all his precious loot and you are going to steal his gems, steal what? all his diamonds. Heroes don't steal. Um, but you have to steal, Nora, because of all the poor people in the village. You have to get them bread so they can eat and it's a very meany dragon oh, and it spews like Robin Hood. Yeah, okay, like Robin Hood. You're going to be Robin Hood. If that makes you happy, we're going to be Robin Hood. But of course the dragon is not gonna like it when you're trying to kill it and when you're trying to steal all his stuff. So every time you make too much noise, the dragon is going to try to get you. Are you making fart jokes, Nora, really? We're trying to do a serious show here. You, you are un unbelievable. So, at the start of the game, we're going to start with the same basic deck of cards, both of us. And during the game, we are going to get more powerful weapons, more powerful allies that are going to help us to get all that special loot. We are going to start at the top of the dungeon, so put your little man there. And because you are going to start the game, and because you farted, you already have one little uh, noise that you're going to put right here. One of those cubes. Put it right there. I don't fart. You did fart. I smelled it. It was horrible. So Nora, play your first five cards, please. Thank you. Now, let's show the viewers what you got. Don't show my cards. Nora, they're going to see this video in two weeks. Then we already finished this game and I've beaten you to pulp. Nora, you tell them. Well, we've now played a few rounds and <laughs> I'm red and Anna's yellow. And just don't look at me. this. <laughs> and over here is like the 30 point artifact. And well, over here is like 15 golden bananas. And I'm over there. <laughs> I You're hate it. you. Look at this. Why am I playing <laughs> I actually like playing games. <laughs> so, in an amazing turn of events, I got the 30 point artifact. Okay. Ooh. Okay. And now I'm gonna take my last steps. But I only need to take one step, but I took like four steps. So I can make a little circle before I go to the end. <laughs> I hate you. <sighs> And now, can I take these? Yes, you can take the extra 20 points! Let me show you how serious this is. I'm standing right here, I only have to take one more step. My next card is going to contain a scramble, and I only have one heart left. And look at what Nora just did. Nora, show them. Show them what you did to me. Show them how you betrayed me. That is one. The one that I did not need anymore, and now I'm dead. I'm dead one step before I could get to the finish line. The dragon is going to get you. Ooh. I hate you. Okay, Nora, now that we played Clank, what did you think of it? Well, with my elven cloak, I sneaked past the dragon and I stole the 30 Point artifact. Ooh. Then, with my singing sword, I slayed the dragon. And then, on a dead run, out of the dungeon, with two lucky points in my pocket, I made it to the finish line with my swagger still on. 
So yeah, I really liked it. <laughs> That's great to hear. And what are we gonna play next time? I don't know, but at least it will be a game that I'm going to win. Howdy folks, welcome to Two Player Showdown. I'm Rebecca, this is Hunter, and today we are going to talk about... Marco! No. The Voyages of Marco Polo. Marco Polo is a dice placement game in which you are doing all sorts of fun things. The main gist of the game is you're trying to gather goods to complete contracts at the same time, traveling across the lands and building trading posts that gives you powers throughout the game. Yes, and what I like about the game are several different things. For one thing, all of the great little components here. We've got gold bars, large and small sizes. We've got spices, and this is silk. We've got our little spice bags, and of course, some adorable little camels. Teeny tiny ones and big ones here. Then, you also have some game-breaking start player powers. For example here, Niccolo and Marco Polo give you two people to travel. It's ridiculous. It's hard to travel with one, but you get two to start. One of my favorites, Rashid here, he lets you pick what numbers you want on the dice. This is crazy. And then Kublai Khan here starts in Beijing, which happens to be the city that has all of the end game conditions. And you start with a hut there, which gives you automatically the end game bonus. They all feel like one or the other should have some crazy advantage over the other players. And yet they all seem to balance out. I just love that about the game. Dice placement is one of my favorite mechanisms in games, but I don't know if Marco Polo should be your starting point. It's kind of a meaty game. I call it a mid, mid-ish weight Euro game. If you're looking for dice placement to train on, I suggest Kingsburg. Kingsburg. No traveling in Kingsburg. But Kingsburg, it's a great kind of intro to dice placement. And if you want to step up from that, then you have Alien Frontiers, which is another amazing dice placement game, but straight back to Marco Polo. Another awesome feature about this game is that if you prefer to play it two-player, like we typically end up doing, there is not much of a variant for this. All the rules are the same, except you use some dice to cover up some of the extra spaces. In Marco! No. The Voyages of Marco Polo is highly recommended by both of us. It takes about 25 minutes per player. Maybe a little longer than that. But... The thing about Marco Polo is, just as you start getting going and the engine's churning, the game ends. It's true. Alright, so if you're getting that traveling bug, I suggest that you take on the voyages of Marco Polo. Thank you so much for joining us. Marco! Polo! Hi Board Game Blender, this is Chris and Lindsay from Behind the Box and today we wanted to take you on a journey and show you a great game called Karuba. Karuba is a tile laying game for two to four players where the aim is to get your explorers to their appropriate temples, picking up treasures along the way and trying to be the first person to get there since you get more points the sooner you get to your temples. Each round a tile will be drawn that will have a certain number on it, for example the number 18. Everybody takes their number 18 tile and places it anywhere on the board. You do this until you either run out of tiles or until one player is able to get all of the explorers to their temples. One thing that I really like about this game is that even though you're all starting with the same map, your explorers are in the same place, your temples are in the same place, and you're drawing the same tiles in the same order, you all wind up with completely different completely situations different, yeah. at the end, and it all just comes down to the route that you decided to take. Another really cool thing about the game is you can change the difficulty. So when you're doing the setup, as a group, you decide where all of the explorers start and all of the temples. So you get to choose, okay, do we want this to be kind of easy? So if you're playing with new groups, it's kind of useful because you can put stuff in a good situation so it's easier to get your explorers to their temples. But if you're playing with the same group and your skill level is increasing as a group and you're starting to get a hang of it, 
you can increase the difficulty. You can put the temples in really awkward positions in relation to their explorers. And that's a lot of fun to sort of play around with that. Yeah, it, it certainly is. So we'd like to know if you've got a game that allows you to transport to different locations. If you do, just let us know in the comments down below. We'd love to hear it. And if you want any more board game discussions with us or reviews from ourselves, then check us out at our own social media. But until the next one, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Dude, 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 dude. I got it. I found it. I found it. Lost City of Z. Check it out. Check it out. See, see, if you go here and then on this round and here, we can find it. Hello everybody and welcome to the life of a board gamer. My name is Daniel and today we are going to talk about a game called The Lost Expedition. It's a game where you are a group of survivors and you are trying to find the lost city of Z. And how do you do that? Well, you have some cards here. First of all, you have some player aid cards, so just to help you play the game. And then you have a bunch of different characters, which you will pick three of. And you will have to go through these cards and try and find the lost city of Z. I'm telling you, we are lost. No, we are not. We should have gone east. No, we shouldn't go west. No, that was left. <laughs> that was the other left. <sighs> we were walking for hours and hours. We are still not going anywhere. And on this journey, you will, of course, uh, encounter lots of different stuff that will try to attack you. Like, for example, we have some nasty insects. There are vampire bats, jaguars. There are lots of different stuff that can hurt you, and there's also spiders. <laughs> Still no city. Where is that lost city of Z? For the love of God. Stop, stop! <coughs> spiders! Yeah. And at the very end, you have some rules to tell you how to play this game. You will have a bunch of different tokens so that you can track your food, health and ammunition that you seriously lack. Like. All three of these. And there are also cute little meeples so you can track where you are and how close to City of Z you actually came. Slavin? 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 For our game under the radar for this episode, I'm going to be taking a look at Michael Schott's Africana here. Africana came out in 2012, but it never got a whole lot of buzz, even though this was around the time that Michael Schott was just about at his most popular. Having, he had a lot of uh, uh, games coming out in the few years before and the few years after that were very popular. Now this one here is based on, uh, in part, another game that had come out from him called Valdora. And uh, the main thing that was taken away and sort of changed is this idea of the, uh, the Book of Adventures system. And that's this little contraption right here, just a little uh, holder, wooden holder with some cards in it. There will be two of these on the board, and you are going to be able to pay coins to flip over pages in the book. And so you'll take a page here, flip it over to the other side, revealing something else. You could pay again, flip another one, and then you could buy and rip a page out of the book uh, as something that you are going to now have, something you are going to work with. So th that system came out of Valdora the original, and that game had a fantasy sort of setting. You know, it was set in a, in a fake world. This one takes that same concept, changes a few things, and sets it, of course, in Africa. And I always found this game to be a lot smoother, a lot more interesting, way more engaging. And it's largely a pick-up-and-deliver game. So I, I've always really enjoyed it. I find it vibrant. I find it clever and interesting. And that is not without its, uh, you know, little rough spots, right? It's, it's uh, the scoring, for example, and sort of the hand management can be a little iffy in points. But overall, I find the game to be really interesting and, and clever. Simply put, you are going to be using these cards here that show you different symbols and colors 
to move on the map. So you can play this card and move to the next spot connected to you that shows that symbol, etc. And trying to complete these cards, these objectives, that very simply are going to list a couple of places, something you get for connecting them, if you would. You are going to go to the one, so in this case, Cairo, pick something up and take it to Lagos, and then you are going to score this card. And you are trying to, if you are playing at a, if you're trying to get as much done as possible, you are trying to have a single movement, so your legs in the game, accomplish multiple things. So maybe uh, at Cairo, you are picking something up, and as you are moving along, you pick up something else of another one of these you've got. You hit uh, Lagos, and then at Lagos, you also deliver that other thing, right? So that's what you're trying to do, be efficient with your movement so that you are getting as much done at the same time as possible. And that's pretty much all there is to it. You're managing a couple of other little things, but it really is a very much a family weight game and a lovely one at that. You know, one that I think uh, on the table and as you are playing is going to have a great uh, appeal, you know, visual appeal. So there you go, that is Africana. One that very few people seem to remember uh, or, or even have uh, played. And it's one that I think deserves uh, some good attention. It's the kind of family weight game that for me highlights all those things I like. Short gameplay, easy to teach and play, something clever about it, that book concept in this case, and attractive and vibrant. So there you go. That is Africana for Under the Radar. Check it out if you've not heard of it, and I'll see you next time. My name is Chris and this is the Teacher's Lounge. Now if you're like me, you've never actually left your home country except for the time that you almost missed your freeway exit in Seattle and got stuck in Canada, but that's a separate story. Also if you're like me, you teach a lot of board games to your friends and to your family. So the Teacher's Lounge is a place where we talk about board game teaching recommendations so that you and the people at the table have a better experience learning a game. Now. I'm going to talk today about connecting point A and B in what I consider to be Alan Moon's best route connection game, and that's not Ticket to Ride. Airlines Europe is my favorite of this type of game that he has designed. Uh, I think that Airlines Europe is a little underappreciated, so let me share with you why I think it's so great, and I'll give you my teaching recommendation. Now if you look at it, right, this shares some similarities to Ticket to Ride. There's a map, and there's different routes that you're trying to connect uh, across. There's a lineup of cards that you will eventually grab. But here's a key and critical difference that you have to know ahead of time. No player is the blue player. No player is the red player or the yellow player. These are all airlines that are independently able to be built up. The key is that you want to have the most shares in these different airlines over the course of the game. So, let's say that I built on my turn this purple airplane, this purple airline route here, and I got to move the airline up six spaces. I've moved it into a new tier here, and as you move this into these different colored tiers, it is now worth more points for the people who own the majority of shares in that company. This is more of a stock game, whereas uh, whereas Ticket to Ride is more of a uh, rummy game where you're grabbing cards and you're trying to lay down sets. This operates differently. The game comes with money that you need to pay for these routes, which we've upgraded to poker chips uh, because it's nicer if you can. And we've taught this to people. It is my stepdad's absolute favorite game to play with us. And so my teaching recommendation is that as you teach this, some people are going to have a hard time grasping uh, certain aspects of games. The biggest thing that people struggle with uh, even when I try and emphasize it, is the idea that no one owns the red airline. No one owns the yellow airline. And that's really critical to understand the flow of the game. So knowing that there are a few trip-up points, 
try and focus on those and emphasize those when you teach. If you're not familiar with what those are, then maybe read some reviews or maybe watch a couple of videos, rules explanations ahead of time. What are the points that maybe you didn't understand when you were first reading the rule book? Make sure to emphasize those points. Or, you know, as, as I've had the experience of, some people don't quite understand it, so when I teach it in the future, I know. I really have to emphasize, we're playing the role of shareholders, not per se the owners of this color airline itself. This game is so fun. I love the tension because after you build an airline, you'll grab one of these either face up or a face down card. It becomes a share that you have in your hand. Over the course of the game, you'll be playing these down and you might steal the majority ownership of an airline from someone else who has spent a lot of time building it up. Or maybe you and someone else are working together, kind of building up the blue airline so it's worth the most points, and you are going to be second place to them, but they get the most points, and you still get a good amount of points for being second, or third place ownership. There's something in this game called positive interaction. Everything that you do might help other people, everything that they do might help you, and so I love that you're trying to manage the best overall positive interaction experience and of course stealing airlines stealing majorities from people is sweet but this game is great definitely overlooked alan moon classic so if you get the chance check out airlines europe and remember as you teach look for those those choke points or look for those points where people might not understand something and really emphasize those as you teach that way people get the most out of the rules explanation my name is chris this is the teacher's lounge thanks so much for coming by Leave your comments below. I'll be responding under the name Meeple Overboard, the podcast that my wife and I do together. Have a great day. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Bickering Over Board Games, where we talk about trends in board gaming and how we feel about them. The topic for the blunder this week is connecting A to B. There are a lot of games that qualify for this in our collection. Yeah, we actually, last night we had a friend over and we first played, played Wasteland Express Delivery Service, which is a game all about getting from point A to B. It's a pick up and deliver game. Yeah, it's a pick up and deliver game. I said that. But, but it's, it's, in terms of win condition, it's not mm. just like money at the end of the game. It's, you know, the first person to complete three uh, priority first class yeah. objectives. And we have a review of this game. We like it a lot. Yeah. And then after we finished Wasteland, we actually played Takedo. About, about having the best vacation in feudal Japan. And, I and guess... we, we didn't even know what the topic was. Like, no. we weren't playing these for any particular uh -uh. reason. But, okay, but these aren't trends. And we were thinking this morning about trends. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that what I wanted to talk about was not just pandemic, the classic, this is the classic edition, game of uh, connecting point A to point B and fighting disease, but specifically, and you guessed it, ugh, I didn't guess it, Pandemic Legacy. Certainly, like, this was a great experience. So we played this with uh, her parents, which, you know, started off great because Pandemic is simple, but then it took us a year to finish, and it was a yeah. lot of fun, um, but thank goodness your parents are They're okay. really good sports and okay yeah. with being... Um, mm. Quarterbacked a little bit? Yeah, they kind of prefer, especially, yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know, so I, I, I don't want to, like, I want to acknowledge that, that, like, we got as more joy out of this box than a lot of games that are sitting around here, but the difference is, is that we are done now, and what do I do with this? I mean, I guess that that's kind of my biggest critique about... Legacy games, specifically the one that I have the most experience with, Pandemic Legacy. And I think another thing with Legacy games, like we said, Pandemic Season 2 is out. And I want to play it so badly. I know, I know, but it's like, we're not going to put my parents through that again, because bless their hearts, that just isn't going to happen. Um, and so then how do we find consistent friends that we can play? And I mean, we live in Utah, which or has a great gaming guild. I mean, there's lots Northern of support. Northern Utah Gamers Guild. For the hobby. But Pandemic in particular, I personally believe, I know people that like changed out the group when they played through it. I think it's a game, Pandemic Legacy, that you play with the same group of people throughout. And I've heard people, uh, uh, Quentin Smith did it, I think, as like a couples game with his wife. Hmm. So we could do that. But I don't know. I just, I'm, it definitely keeps me from buying games or trying games that I want to play. Like I want to play Charterstone. 
Um, I want to try Seafall. Uh, speaking of legacy games, one game that I think it'll work really well that they've announced is a legacy version of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Oh yeah, I'm excited about that. I mean, that's a game that I could see owning for like five to ten years and still not finishing that legacy element because that's how often we play that game. Yeah, and we have a really solid group of friends that we play that game with, so it would mm. be easy to keep that. It's our Halloween game, right? Yeah, and yeah, so I mean, I'm not opposed to them. I think that they're fun. I like creating the story and keeping it going. My biggest concern is just we need to figure out something to do with the board, with the game, because yeah. you can't trade it, you can't resell it, and so what do we do with that waste? No, I, I'm not against them in the hobby. I'm not against the trend towards legacy games. And, you know, Rob Davio has actually said that one of the reasons why he wanted to make Pandemic Legacy was to force people to play a game as many as 12 times. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a problem in the, in the hobby that is. is worth addressing. It is. There's... Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that is a good point and kind of cool. It's a huge commitment. It is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's like getting married. Okay. To a board game. Yep. For 12 games. You'd love that, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Weird. <laughs> okay, on that note. Cheers. Hi, I'm Max from Games of Families. Hi, I'm John, also from Games of Families. Hi, Dad. And we have a magic dog. <laughs> Our 10 month old toy poodle puppy has consumed so much dice that he's now got a pretty good idea which of two perfectly good games is actually the better one. So join us now as we find out that Gizmo knows. So Gizmo, hello. My name is Near and Far by Ryan Lockett, uh, published last year by Red Raven Games. Now, this has had a lot of love on the Dice Tower channel generally, so I'm not going to go through what it is. I'm going to give you three reasons why it's a great family game. One is, it's beautiful, it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's just got this huge visual appeal. Are you listening to me, Gizmo? The second is, it's actually, although it's competitive, it's not cutthroat competitive, and you're kind of pleased when the people have make, made a really nice thing, or built a tent, or gone on a long journey. It kind of has that feeling of gentle competition, which is perfect for families. And the third reason is the storytelling. The storytelling games are already uh, attractive to a family audience, but the quality of the writing in this is absolutely second to none for a game. I know you don't speak English, Gizmo, but please, choose this one. <laughs> Hello Gizmo, I chose uh, Steampunk Rally because it um, is a fast game, you know, because it's a race game and, you know, you're building these contraptions, you're placing dice in them to power them and just racing them and at the end you blow them up if you want. I never blow them up because I don't like blowing up my inventions. And you'll like it because there's lots of running around in the hills. You like hills, you said they're big hills, they're called mountains. They're called the Alps and they're in Switzerland. And you all get to be an inventor. Oh, he's bored already. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're using all these amazing pieces to build and upgrade and race these machines. And I think it's really fun. It is for all ages, even though it looks really complicated, and it isn't. Let the gizmo be released! Oh! Come on! Let's go, let's go. Don't worry. It's Let the gizmo. So it turns out Steampunk Rally beat off near and far, a bit of a turn up, but actually a really good game that doesn't get quite enough love. I guess. Technically it was a draw because he took it. Anyway, yeah. there, is, there is some controversy about the result. Please do go to our, um, uh, our channel, YouTube, Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, check us out, we've got all sorts of things, lots of things coming up. And I uh, hope you have a really good Easter and we will see you soon. Bye bye. So that's going to do it for us on this episode of Blender. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you found at least one new game you had not heard about or maybe one you forgot about and it rekindles your interest in that game. A big thanks of course to all my contributors as always and hey, don't forget, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.